Hello, and welcome to our third and final session on the practice of threat informed defense. And I am extremely pleased to have Chris Nisley and Steve Luke here. These two, hi guys, thanks for joining. Hi, Jonathan. Hi. Great. So these two gentlemen lead MITRE Attack Defender. Um, which is a certification process that MITRE's recently developed to train all of you, right? All of you just click on subscribe now to getting trained in MITRE Attack Defender um, and how to use attack to make the most of your cybersecurity and to increase your cybersecurity effectiveness. And so Chris is the general manager for MITRE Attack Defender, um, and he has a deep background in, in the commercial sector and in management, and it's great to have him. And Steve uh, has a background in, in cybersecurity operations in the federal government, and he leads content uh, for MITRE Attack Defender. Do I have that right, guys? That's right. Yeah, you do. Great. Yeah. Good. Okay. And so it's it's Steve Luke, like Luke Skywalker, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. May yeah. the force be with yeah, you. Yeah. Although, yeah, <laughs> may the force be with you. And since it's purple team, we have purple hats. Like maybe we'll have Mace Windu's purple lightsaber. Come exactly. Nice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Good. We'll send yeah, okay. those too. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Okay, so we've just come out of a session. We had an earlier session on, on Purple Team Operations, and we've just come out of a session on the history of attack in the Center for Threat Informed Defense. And the question we want to focus on now is, like, how do you put attack into practice? Like, what's the so what of, of making things happen? Um, and this really comes down to the importance of training, and that's training for, for threat informed defense operations. So, gentlemen, what is MAD? And how did it evolve? Why don't we um, start with you, Chris? Yeah, so uh, MAD is MITRE Attack Defender. It's this new program, as Jonathan mentioned, that we just launched about two months in now. Um, and it really is a, about educating the community. So it's freely available training uh, on some key aspects of putting MAD, uh, putting attack into use. Uh, and then a whole certification program around uh, validating the mastery of those skills. So um, I'll let Steve weigh in a little bit on, on an aspect here, but one of the things we really found is, and I know I've done it numerous times when I have to watch a video for uh, some sort of training, you watch the video in the background, you think you've got the materials, uh, you go about your day, and then when it comes time to actually use that, you don't really know what you were doing. So we wanted to find some way to make sure we got the training out there and let you really prove that you knew the skills. Yeah, that's great. You know, we at Attack IQ, with um, with with help from the, the the MITRE Ingenuity team and building on the research of the Attack team, we published MITRE Attack for Dummies. So I'm a firm believer in the training process. Um, but having never been an operator, I want to pivot to Steve and say, Steve, like, so what what is it? What are the key things in your, you lead content for defenders. So what are the key lessons that you want cybersecurity operators to take away as they embark on this journey? Yeah, so there are kind of uh, sort of three main uh, use cases uh, that we're teaching. One is sort of, you know, to begin with the end in mind is, you know, how do you defend yourself using knowledge about adversarial TTPs? And that's a key aspect of what attack is really all about is, documenting what adversaries do at the level of TTPs, you know, at the top of the pyramid of pain, so that these are the things that adversaries kind of, you know, are constrained in how they can operate, unlike lower level IOCs that more traditional defenses focus on. And so one of the things that we teach is how do you assess your current defensive posture and how do you use knowledge from attack to improve that posture, to implement new mitigations or, or detections. So that's one of the three things. And then the second thing is to test those defenses. You really want to be able to inject real malicious activity uh, that really um, you know, emulates what actual adversaries do. And one of the other great things about attack is that it is based on documented adversary behavior out there in the wild. And so, you know, that's the real stuff that's really going on. Um, and so one of the, the second things that uh, we teach is threat emulation. How do you take that knowledge from attack and um, emulate those activities in a way that's realistic, but also in a way that really helps the defenders get better, right? The purpose of threat emulation is not to win, um, but to make the defenders better. 
so that's a, a second thing that we teach. And the third is um, how to capture um, adversarial behaviors in the form of TTPs, tactics and techniques um, in alignment with attack. And so the first course uh, that we've produced is uh, attack fundamentals. That's just attack 101. The second course was cyber threat intelligence. So how do you take narrative reporting or reverse engineering or dynamic analysis results and figure out what those behavioral things are that are going on and map them to attack techniques? What we're coming out with next are the courses on threat emulation and threat hunting. So how do you use that for your defenses? And one of the first things you wanna do when you're um, improving your defenses is to evaluate where you are now. And that's the third course that we came out with um, in this first launch, which is SOC assessment. Lovely. So look at your current um, detections, your current data sources, map them against attack, and try to figure out where you're strong, but where you need to improve next and how to prioritize those. Yeah. Have you, could you talk a little bit about how you've actually seen attack and the things you've just described improve measurably a cybersecurity mm -hmm. program, like in the real world? Sure. Well, for one, uh, you know, just attack in and of itself has provided a common language for people to speak across this space. So when we're sharing intel um, and we want to share things at the level of TTPs, attack gives us that way of communicating where we're all talking about the same thing using the same language. And that's something that was already possible with lower level IOCs, but attack gives us that ability to speak at the behavioral level uh, to each other. But it also um, has enabled uh, threat emulation teams to become more realistic so that they're not just doing sort of classic pen testing of, you know, throwing exploits and, you know, trying to get from point A to point Z um, the best they can. And that sets up defenders uh, to really evaluate how effective they are um, against realistic threats. And then finally, what we've seen is a big community grow up around um, attack for defensive applications. So analytic repositories and cybersecurity researchers orienting around how do you mitigate against these techniques and what kind of analytics could you use to detect them? Yeah, yeah, so um, I mean, I've heard from folks in the public and the private sectors about how transformative attack has been for level setting effectiveness and I think my sense is that we're beginning to get to a place now six years in where you can actually measure a return on investment. And I'm just wondering in your in your work with different organizations, if you've seen teams change and improve their operations as they've adopted attack. So I, I get that there's like a, mm -hmm. a common framework. I'm just wondering if there's like a, a like an ROI that you've perceived. Definitely, I think so. So, and I think purple teaming is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. um, so purple teaming really enables you to test yourself in sort of a scientific method kind of way, right? So hypothesis, I'm gonna be able to detect when this technique occurs in my network. How am I gonna test that hypothesis? Well, I need a threat emulation team to come in and execute that technique and prove to myself that I will detect it when it occurs and that it'll have good precision and recall um, on that analytic. So as a result of this knowledge of attack techniques and the purple teaming process, I think that I've seen lots of organizations shift the type of data they collect and the way that they focus um, on collecting it and analyzing it. So they're not just measuring um, how many times does an IOC you know, fire um, in my uh, network? How many things did I block? Um, but it's more, uh, in addition to that now, we can say, how many of these techniques can I detect? How many of these techniques can I stop? And I think that's a, a very meaningful uh, metric that allows you to, to focus limited um, resources on the highest priorities. If I add there, I think one of the things Steve's kind of drilled into my head that I think is really important in this is, one of the big things of ROI is, like, how brittle are your uh, analytics that detect things? Like it's pretty easy for you as a defender to write an analytic that looks for an IP address and blocks it, right? Anybody can do that and straightforward. But it's also super easy for the bad guys to change which IP, uh, IP address they're using. So how do you move up level and write analytics that are less brittle, more enduring, 
and inflict more pain. So instead of blocking one IP address, we look for the underlying behavior, the thing they're trying to achieve, and we stop that. And that's what attack really allows you to do and create those better analytics. I think, you know, uh, Steve, maybe uh, some of the things you've been looking at recently on um, some recent newsworthy attacks has shown that there are analytics out there that could detect these things, yeah. uh, but they're maybe deployed correctly. Are you talking about Colonial Pipeline or, right. or JVS, the, the ransomware attacks? Well, with many of these, and the one that I looked into um, more recently in detail was SolarWinds, um, you know, they, they ended up using 85 uh, attack techniques, of which 80 had already been published in attack, of which 77 were left unmodified in version 9. So there was nothing you know, new enough about the way that APT29 employed them to require a change. So that gives you a sense for the value in investing in uh, defending against those techniques because they're being reused even by advanced actors who are going to extraordinary lengths to um, conceal themselves. So if you had taken an IOC approach, right, you're basically hopeless, right? Because they have changed all of the signatures uh, that, that they would have been uh, leaving behind. But at the behavioral level, they were largely the same. Now, what Chris is pointing out is that of those 77 techniques, about 64 already had analytics that were published for them. But of those, only about 14 were robust enough to really focus on the behavior and not a specific implementation that had been used by a different actor in the past. And so I think that's a real area for improvement. If we as a community can kind of get together and um, figure out a better way to write analytics that will um, be robust to these little implementation changes that adversaries could make um, for relatively low cost and e either detect those techniques or at least impose the cost on the adversary to um, employ or develop new techniques. Wow, that's, I feel like that's a very rich conversation. I, I, hear the, I hear sort of two parts to this. And the first part that I hear is, and I love the story about solar winds, and I've told it as well. It's like when CISA on December 18th wrote about the, well, wrote its alert about solar winds, it used attack to describe the adversary behavior, which immediately says to defenders, like, hey, if you'd, if you'd run emulations using what we know about APT29, which is obviously one of the biggest threat actors in the world, and you'd, you'd use the attack framework, you could have run those emulations against your defenses to determine your effectiveness, right? But those are the ones that, like, there's a mixture where, where CISA did the analysis and they, they did some forensics to say these are the tactics that they used. But what you're actually saying, it, it sounds like there's another part to it, which is that there's, there is room to deepen the analytics uh, in some way. Can you talk a little bit more about the analytics, that right. part? Sure, sure. So, um you know, what attack tells us about a technique is an overall description of the technique, uh, detection concepts, data sources that you can use to detect it, and mitigation ideas. It also provides us with procedural examples. Now, if you're an analytic developer and you're using that um, technique page from attack to develop an analytic, um, you know, there's a lot of information there, but you're still having to do a fair amount of research um, to interpret that information and create an analytic. And, you know, one of the constant things that analytic developers have to do is balance reducing the number of false positives they're seeing with ensuring that they will actually detect um, the malicious activity when it occurs. And there's usually a trade-off between those two, because if I, if I exclude some false positives, I'm basically leaving a blind spot for the adversary to fit into, right? Um, but I can't deal with too many false positives or I'll start ignoring the alert to begin with. So. What we're going to teach in this threat hunting course is um, how to find what we're calling behavioral invariants. So these are the behaviors that happen when that technique is implemented, regardless of the implementation details. And I think that um, it's not going to be, uh, not every technique has behavioral invariants. And, and sometimes you have to break the technique down into you know, subcomponents. Um, and there's a behavioral invariant for the, the subcomponents or the use cases for them. Um, but when there are behavioral invariants, I think that's a key link between the information on attack and an analytic. Um, and if we can write the analytic 
to detect those behavioral invariants, I think it'll be a lot more robust to implementation changes. Um, so for example, one of the analytics that had been published um, for uh, AD find, right, actually had a chance of detecting it for is. the behavioral, for those. yep, the Active Directory um, tool uh, that APT29 used in SolarWinds. Um, and they had um, an an there was an analytic published that looked for some of the behaviors of that tool, but it also included an and clause that the image name had to end with adfind.exe. And APT29 changed the name of that executable. And so that analytic wouldn't have worked. Um, so that's an example where, you know, maybe we, we have an opportunity there um, to create the analytic where it's more focused on the behavioral itself and less focused on the name of the file or the tool or, or something that would be easier for the adversary to change. Things that are lower down on uh, Bianco's pyramid of pain. I mean, if that's not an endorsement to sign up for a course, uh, I can't imagine what it would be. That That's amazing. And that, I think that speaks quite directly to, the, to how attack needs to evolve to stay, or, or not attack, but the analytic community needs to evolve to stay ahead of the adversary. Um, and that's that's an incredibly valuable, incredibly valuable lesson. I think there's a connection to purple teaming there too, since that's the theme of the day, um, in that purple teams, uh, the, the threat emulators in the purple team have the opportunity to help the defenders find uh, the ro more robust analytic by varying those little implementation details during the purple team to expose to the blue side uh, the things about their approach that might be brittle. Um, and so I've used purple teaming uh, with some of my uh, sponsor organizations to help them explore that space a little more fully um, and be sure that they're not, because it's easy to accidentally do this. It's easy to accidentally write um, an analytic that's honing in on an artifact of an implementation choice uh, that could be easily changed. And having that iterative cycle back and forth between red and blue um, really helps raise the game for both sides um, because the blue team can see, oh, I caught your first implementation of that technique, but I was too brittle to catch the second implementation. And when the red team sees the analytic that's being written by the blue team, they might identify, oh, you're honing in on this thing. I could change that in my next run uh, through the purple team and help the blue team understand the brittleness that they have in their current approach. Yeah, wow, that's really impressive. You know, as you talk about this, like, and I, I think historically, um, in the way that, that defense organizations have had to evolve throughout history to counter threats, right? Like, this is this seems to me, and I was never a cryptographer, and I, um, I, I never was on a nuclear submarine, but the level of detail and scientific knowledge required for an organization to defend themselves against cyber attacks today feels higher um, than, say, other, mil other kinds of military operations in the past, right? Like, you, you need to have this level of knowledge about tactics and techniques, and that's what makes this so important and, and really puts a – the thought that comes to my mind is this, this is putting a premium on the education of the defenders, and, and what you're doing here is you're, you're still driving towards effectiveness, but you're requiring a level of analytic capability that seems pretty high. Is that right? Yeah. Well, you know, one way to think about it is you have to understand your systems as well as the adversary does. And the adversary is putting a tremendous amount of effort into understanding how these systems truly work, not just the surface of how they're supposed to work or how they normally work, but they're going deep and understanding how to um, manipulate them to do things that they weren't intended to do uh, to begin with. Um, and so uh, the defenders need that depth of knowledge as well. And I think that we don't all have to do that on our own from scratch. We can band together as a community and share that information with each other. And that's one of the beautiful things about Attack is it's out there, public, free, freely available, um, sharing information that used to be known, I think, by only a few. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and uh, part of the value is just sharing it out there so that everybody can get the value, but also contribute in uh, to it. And it becomes a community effort and we sort of crowdsource uh, our defensive research. Yeah, it's, it's very transformative. And Chris, I want to, we talked a little bit about the, the benefits of lowering the barrier to entry. And I want to talk about that, but 
I think I think the thing here is like we never used to have a common language. Now we have the common language for the last six years. And now we're building the capabilities around that common language to defend ourselves more effectively. And that is quite transformative. Like to me, it's it. Um, the, a lot of cybersecurity reporters haven't spent a lot of time thinking about MITRE ATT&CK, for example. And I talk to them about solar winds, and I say, "Listen, you need to understand. Like we, we map they they map these tactics and techniques in MITRE ATT&CK, and the government announced it. Now, what needs to happen is." All the defensive community, the defensive community needs to learn how to use this tool and come together. So it's 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 really great what you, what you what you all are doing. But um, Chris, you want to talk a little bit about yeah the lower lowering barrier to entry? Well, there's two things. Before I get to that, I think one of the things you're highlighting is um, since Rich was on earlier, one of the things he said he was involved with us at the beginning of this whole process. Uh, so, you know, the the adversaries live in a world that's a ruthless meritocracy. Right. So they live or die by their success of getting into a network, getting that ransomware payment, whatever. Nobody cares if they watched a video or earned a CEU or went to a class, whatever. All this is irrelevant. They go on to whatever forums they want and they try techniques and they try them until they don't work and they move on to another technique and they keep doing that and the strongest survive. And that's why it's important that we get people trained in these processes and, you know, able to communicate because we have to have build that same meritocracy. Right. And John, and you mentioned the, some of the DHS, the, the way they talk about um, solar winds, you know, DHS just published a CISA just published a great guide on using attack for cyber threat intelligence. And it's, it's a great document. It, you, know, you can go to the CISA site and download it. Uh, it covers the same things, at a very high level that you'd learn in our CTI course. And that's the key for us building this community is how do you use attack so that this community of defenders can collaborate in an effective way and we can have that same meritocracy where you know we're able to communicate real in real time as those things are happening in a way that our systems can understand and our blue teams can understand, our red teams can understand, and we can make the, the whole system better. Yeah, and of course, you know, I, I, what, we're, what we're trying to do at Attack IQ is we, we take adversary emulations and assessments, and we now string the TTPs together in what we call an anatomic engine. Because you're right, the adversary is just going to keep coming after your defenses. They're going to keep trying. So the goal in our automation is to string these tactics together in a continuous campaign in an automatic fashion. So it tests machine learning and artificial intelligence based cyber defense capabilities. So the purple teams can do the kinds of things that you both are talking about um, to validate to validate effectiveness. Because we do have to lower the barrier to entry, right? So we have to make this the threat knowledge as available and use and usable fundamentally as possible. Yeah, I mean you've got two major things in um, in sort of staffing, right, in this problem for defenders. One, I, I haven't seen an updated number in a while, but I know for a, uh, for a while, the even amongst the Fortune 1000 companies, only something like 70% had a CISO. Like even one person in that role whose job was to oversee this. Uh, and then everyone hears about this massive shortage of cybersecurity professionals. So if there are millions of unfilled defender jobs out there, and we have millions of people that are either trying to get out of manufacturing or, you know, other jobs and move into cybersecurity because they hear that it's the way to go and they go submit their resume. And, and what's the first thing that happens is the automated resume system kicks you out because you don't have a certification. Mm -hmm. That certification probably would have cost you thousands of dollars in the past. Right? I mean, you got to take a, a week long course. You got to pay for yourself because your employer is not paying for it. You've got to go sit for a four hour exam where you've got to memorize all this stuff that is, you know, I mean, it's good background knowledge, but nobody defends a network with a book, right? You use the internet, you use attack navigator, you use attack IQ, you use these tools. And that's what helps you find the things fast. So we really wanted to lower the barrier with MITRE attack defender so all the training is free, and then the certification piece, it's 299 bucks a year, and it's kind of all you can eat. So you don't pay for every test. 
you you can take the attack fundamentals test. If you don't pass it the first time, you come back the next day and take it again. And you can take it again and again every day until you do pass it. It's an open book test, open internet test. So go online. You're going to have to go online. You can't memorize the answers. You have to use Attack Navigator. You have to search the attack knowledge base, the exact same things you would do if you were a defender operating in the real world. So we really did try to change the game and in how we can open up the market, we can fill that gap and make it much more practical. That's awesome. I wish the GRE had been free, particularly the math section. That would have been great. <laughs> I would have taken that over and over, um, or at least one more time. You know, um, this is this is excellent. I mean, I think like getting spreading the word, getting folks educated, and helping increase cybersecurity effectiveness is, is so important. So let's we just have a couple more minutes. So I wanted to see if you have any any parting thoughts about like where you want the cybersecurity, cybersecurity community to go in adopting attack to improve operational effectiveness? Yeah, I'll, I'll say one thing real quick, and then I'm sure Steve's got some some uh, closing comments. But I think this idea of community and you know, certainly a lot of the work that you guys are doing with the Attack Academy and the community that you're building, um, that idea of getting this uh, cadre of informed defenders together and really building off of each other you know, we're going to keep adding into MITRE ATT&CK Defender as well along that. So access to resources, access to other people. Um, I think that's just critical to making this, the community better and upskilling everyone. Yep. Good. Very well said. What about you, Steve? Yeah, I guess my, my feeling is that, you know, ATT&CK has huge potential, um, only some of which has been realized so far. And I do think that we need to band together as a community. And part of what I'm hoping to accomplish with uh, MITRE ATT&CK Defender is to um, you know, build up uh, the group of people who understand how to uh, use it and how to capitalize on, that, um, on some of that untapped potential. Uh, and I think if we can all um, get together uh, around that and learn how to use it and collaborate with each other, uh, we're going to do much better as a community um, against these adversaries. Great. Yeah. I mean, I think we should, we should open open up um, a briefing for the press and policymakers in DC to get, get folks educated too, so that they talk more about it um, in, in like really public fashions to educate the public too. Right. Like it's such an important and transformative thing. And I'm shocked by how many people haven't heard about it. Um, you know, the technical technical teams obviously have, but we got to keep getting the word out. Um, so thank you both for joining and talking about this today. It's wonderful work that you're doing. Um, Chris, again, Chris Nisley and Steve Skywalker, Luke, um, <laughs> joining us from MITRE ATT&CK Defender. Sign up, take their courses. They're free, obviously. So, you, you know, get the certification. It's cheaper than the GRE and it'll probably take you further in life. Um, yeah. Thanks, gents. Really appreciate it. Great to have you on. Thanks for inviting awesome. us. Thanks, Jasmine. Of course. Great to be here. It's almost time for our closing keynote, which I'm sure you're not going to want to miss. Uh, you know what time it is. It's time for another break. So we'll see you back here in five minutes. <laughs>